Okay, we are going to talk this morning about a very interesting subject that doesn't get talked about very often in church, which is quite strange. Over these tw last 12 months or so, you will have felt and heard from the front a real thread and an underlying thrust to get us into that idea and that culture of inviting people to church, of sharing the gospel, of getting on the mission that Jesus commanded us and left us with to go make disciples of the nations. There's been much said to us about reconnecting with God, drawing near to him, plugging in as it were, jumping into the river, recapturing our identities in Christ, seeing again the awesomeness of God. There's been challenges, encouragements, calling out. God has been equipping us, encouraging us and empowering us to get focused on his will and on his kingdom. As Pete Wassell spoke about the awesomeness of God last week, I was struck by how much of the church forget and paper over the things that make God worthy of our all. Pete did this last week, but look at the word for a moment, awe. A feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. The church on a whole, and even some of us, focus much of our time on the wonder side of that word. We love to talk about the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the acceptance of God. We love to point out that Jesus came to save us. He went to the cross and saved us. But how often do we explain what we're being saved from? As I was preparing in my usual way, I came across a Facebook post by a guy called David Carr. Some of you will know David. Very interesting fella. Met him a few times. But I always find what he says to have an edge. And I like it. It really helped to really solidify in my mind what it was the direction for this morning's sermon needed to be. And this is what the post said. This is David Carr saying it, not me. Reading media quotes from a leading past of an evangelical leader, you ask the question, how has he moved so far away from biblical teaching? I sat there thinking, I feel a warning coming on me. It starts when our preaching so majors on the love and grace of God that we no longer preach the reason for that love. Humanity is in sin, not popular but true. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Yet the gift of God, Christ, is eternal life. So his love and grace become operative. When we confess our sin, repent of our sin, then the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Then his love and grace respond to the faith that is generated by his word. When we only preach a distorted love, when we preach a diluted grace, we diminish the responsibility of humanity to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The soul that sins will die. Jesus both preached and believed in hell. All through his teaching, he warns about the consequences of a life not born of the Spirit, a life that has never repented. Today, many preachers are living in a theological flower power generation. All you need is love, la, la, la. God becomes the forgiver of all, regardless of their need to confess sin. Therefore, we change our biblical stance on many issues that have for centuries been clear and understandable. I'm hearing statements that would have had our early church fathers gasp and cry out apostasy if we preach another gospel or no gospel 
anathema. If you haven't figured out already what today is going to be about, it's going to be a hard subject for me to preach, but it's going to be a hard subject for you to hear. I just pray that you keep your hearts open and the egg throw into the end. If you want to speak to me at the end of this sermon about anything that I've said, please do. Don't go away having bottled up what might come out. You see, the subject I felt drawn to speak on this morning is not one you hear in lots of churches. The subject is hell. But before we go on that journey, let's just read from John 3, verse 14 to 18. I've got lots to get through, so I'll just read it. John 3, verse 14 to 18. Check me out when you get home. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I wanted to start this morning with that passage so that we've got fixed in our minds and in our hearts that God came to save us. It is not God's heart, will or desire for any to perish. Jesus went to the cross to save us from that which I'm about to speak about. <laughs> one of the questions I need to answer is this one. Because it will be one that maybe you've battled with. But it will definitely be one that other people that you know battle with. Hell. Does it exist? Or is it something that preachers have made up to scare people into membership? Well, to answer that question... I need to go back to the Bible. This morning, you are going to get a lot of Bible. Why? Because this is a subject that a man shouldn't take on without coming straight from God's word. So, we're going to answer it from the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm going to throw lots of passages at you. I'm just going to read them because I've got lots to say. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. I'm setting the standard. If it's in there, it's God. If it's in there, it's truth. And we're told to test all things. Like the Bereans did when Paul went and preached to them. They went back to their scriptures they went back to the Old Testament, to the Torah that they had. And they tested it, is what Paul's saying, backed up by that. If it's not in there, then it ain't right. We're called to be like those. The Bible is the standard, it's the plumb line. It should be the standard that you, you judge anybody who stands up here. If what they say cannot be found in the pages of this book or cannot be backed up by the pages of this book, then guys, throw it away. And that goes for what I say. So, is hell real? In Mark 9, 43 to 48, Jesus is warning people about hell. If it wasn't real, why did Jesus himself warn people? 
It says this, Mark 9, 43, 48. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus isn't saying, go cut your hands off. He's not saying, go pluck your eyes out. What he's saying here is whatever it is that causes you to sin, whatever relationship you're in, whatever things you watch on TV, whatever things you go on to on the internet, whatever you are loving that causes you to sin, to turn your face from Jesus and do something that offends him, get rid of it. Why? Because it is better for you to have got rid of that in this life than to end up being thrown into hell with it attached to you. Where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. If hell was not a real place, what is Jesus talking about? The original word being used here that's, that we've translated as hell it's actually from an Anglo-Saxon word. Hell is an Anglo-Saxon word. And it just means a covered place, a hidden place, a cave or a cavern. It's describing this place that Jesus is talking about. A dark place that cannot be got to. It's covered over, it's hidden. But actually, it's a translation of the word that Jesus was using, which is Gehenna which in itself is a Greek translation of Hinnom, the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom is a valley about, it's south of Jerusalem. It's just outside the city. And in times gone past, and you can read it in the book of Kings and in Chronicles, some horrendous things took place there for Israel. It became a place of Moloch worship where fires would be lit and children would be sacrificed. It was a place of pagan worship. It was a horrible place. And it, it, got, to a, it got to a time when King Josiah came on the scene and he looked at... Hinnom. And he said, no more, we can't have this. We're God's people. I'm not having this around my city, around God's city. So he kicked out all the altars. He kicked out all the pagan worshippers. But it was such a defiled place that he had no use for it other than a dumping ground. And it's said that all the waste from Jerusalem used to get dumped into the valley of Hinnom. And fires would be set to burn that stuff that could be burned. And the food waste and the biological waste, the worms and the maggots would eat. So you see, when Jesus talked about hell, he's talking about Gehenna, which is the valley of Hinnom. He's talking about a place where there is fire. Where there are worms and maggots and all things horrible where there is a stench, where there is death, where there is no God. It's a vivid picture that Jesus gives us of this place called hell. And that word Gehenna or Hinnom is used mainly by Jesus. It's really interesting that the majority of the teaching that we get on the place of hell comes from Jesus himself. 
Most people would look to the Old Testament and say, it must be in there because that's where God was rough. That's where the judgment of God was. That's where we see God in that kind of frame. No. Hell is taught in the New Testament, the place of grace the place of forgiveness, the place of love, by the only one qualified to teach it. The only one we would listen to and not argue with his authority. Some other references for you to study at home. Matthew 5, 22 to 30. Matthew 5, 10 to 20, Matthew, Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 18, 9, Matthew 23, 15 to 33, and Luke 12, 5, James 3, 6. Matthew eleven twenty three says this, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. And Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome. Luke 16, 23. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now the word being used here is the word Hades. And this is a Greek word that was used to translate a Hebrew word, Sheol. Again, Sheol talks about a place where after you die you go to. And you are kept there till judgment. I haven't got time to go into that. But when we're talking about hell, the words are used in the Bible. We see the word Gehenna used. We see the, the word Hades used. We see the, the word Hinnom used or Sheol. The last text that I want to use to answer, is hell a real place? Is 2 Peter 2 verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. God did not spare the angels that sinned. He put them in chains, in darkness, ready to go into hell. The word that Peter used there is a Greek word, Tartarus. It's only used once in the Bible. And he talks in of abyss of a dark place where there's no light, a deep hole where no one can come out of. It's got lots of parallels with that which Jesus spoke about, Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. So regardless of what name is used in the Bible, be that Hades, be that Sheol, be that Gehenna, be that the Valley of Hinnom, be that Tartarus, be that hell, be that Hades. I think we can see from the word of God that hell is a real place. It is someone, somewhere that people will go. If you've been questioning whether hell exists, if nothing else, I should have sparked your mind to look at the Bible. Because Jesus said it did. I then have to ask the question, what is hell like then? Well, we've already heard from some of the descriptions that Jesus gave. But again, we'll go back to the scriptures. Matthew 13, 40 to 42. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the burning furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Matthew 13, 49 to 50. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace there where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Mark 9, 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Revelation 14, 9 to 11, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lord and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Okay, so we see blazing fire, burning sulfur, torment, gnashing of teeth and weeping. This paints a horrible picture in my mind. It starts to break my heart for the people that I love that don't know Jesus. And I think at this point, it's good to remind ourselves of John 3, 14 to 18. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. The father's heart is breaking for those that don't know him this morning. Mark 25, Matthew 25 verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was never created for people. It was a punishment, it was a jail, it was a prison. It was a horrible place for the devil and his angels. It was not created. God's heart, his desire is none should suffer. None should be lost. There are other passages that we could read that talk about blackest darkness, stench, a place devoid of hope, joy, love, peace, devoid of God. Remember the words Jesus shouted towards the end of his crucifixion? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A cry of utter loneliness and abandonment. It's chilling. Okay, so the Bible clearly says there is a hell and it clearly describes that environment. What do people think out there, even in the church? How do they how do they balance this out? What alternatives do people give to what the Bible actually says? One thing that people state is that you make your own hell here on earth. I think it's clear from the few passages we've read that's not true. There are some people going through lots of things here on earth that would be considered hellish and they don't deserve it. And there are lots of people that are going through things that aren't going through things here that they do deserve. That is not God. God is a just God. And therefore this can't be hell. Hell is somewhere God sends people to. It is a place prepared for the devil. However, to the absolute heartache of our God, those that reject him, those that live in sin, not covered by the blood of Jesus because they have refused to call upon his name or willfully just continue sinning will allow the devil to drag them into judgment with no defence. 
and they too will be sent to hell by a holy and just God. Another idea that has crept into the church, and I didn't realise how big this was until I started looking at it, is one called universalism. That all will eventually be saved. That God will find a way, even after he's put them in hell, to cause them to come back to himself, and he'll rescue them from there. Nice thought. But that's all it is. You see, it denies the truth of salvation through Jesus. That a person decides to either trust in Jesus or else he, she rejects Christ and goes to hell. John 3, 16. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the Father. Of God's only, one and only Son, sorry. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Universalism is a nice idea, like I said, but that's all it is. It's not truth. People have to make a choice here on earth. Hebrews 9, 27, 28. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Matthew 25, 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You see, eternal means forever. So if universalism is true and you get a second, third, fourth, fifth chance when you're in hell, then how is your punishment eternal forever? Doesn't stack up to scripture. The other thing that has crept into the church, not us by the way, I'm saying general, but it may be a belief that you hold here. I don't know all of your thinking when it comes to hell. But another belief that has crept into the church is annihilationism. That basically, after the judgment, you will cease to exist if you do not know Jesus. Unfortunately, this, like universalism, is a nice thought. But it denies the very reason for Jesus' crucifixion. If universalism was right and annihilationism was right, why on earth did Jesus come and die on a cross for us? Why did he go through the pain and the suffering? Why was his blood spilt if there was no need? Too many passages talk about eternal punishment. The Greek phrase used is aeonis ton aeonon. Something like that. <laughs> Nobody's going to correct me on that one today because she's in there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is translated forever and ever. It occurs 18 times in the Greek New Testament. And in 17 of those examples, the phrase means without end, extending into infinity. When they say eternal, it means forever. There is no let up. To dismiss or change the meaning of this phrase would, like I said, actually dismiss the reason for Jesus dying on the cross. You'll be happy to know the last thing, and I've rushed through this a little bit. But the last thing I want to briefly look at is would a loving God really send people to hell? This is possibly the most used objection to hell that Christians have and that non Christians have. It's one of our biggest headaches. Because we cannot contemplate this question. We know, each one of us in here knows a loving God. We know Jesus as crucified saviour, who died on a cross to save us, 
who forgives us every sin. He said it early. God said it earlier. He wants to break the chains. That doesn't come from a harsh God. That comes from one that loves you. So how then can people be sent to hell? How can a loving God send people to hell? When you become a Christian, there's something that we do. We confess Jesus as Lord and Saviour over our lives. Over every part of our lives. Do you know what you did when you confessed him as Lord of your life? Because when you confess him as Lord of your life, you are saying, God, every part of my life, every part of my thinking, every part of my heart, I put you over the top of it. You are Lord over everything, over my understanding, over my experiences, over my hurts, over my pains, over my successes, over my failures. You are Lord. And if I think with a human heart, with a human mind and a human heart, I cannot understand how a loving God can send people to hell. But I confess Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. And therefore, his book, he's Lord of. If I look at his book and what it tells me, and I say, I don't think that's quite right then all of a sudden I am making myself Lord over his word and over him. I don't understand it. I don't like it. I have friends, I have family that don't know Jesus. Just like you do. And I hate the fact that the truth is that some of those people will never come to know Jesus. I never want to know Jesus. And I hate the fact that the Bible tells me the consequence of that is hell. And I could make any excuse I want and try and rewrite this thing in my own mind so that it's more pleasant for me to think about. But then I would make myself Lord and I put Jesus under me. Jesus said that some will go to eternal punishment and some will go to eternal life. So why can a God who loves us the way he loves us and a God who is called love, how can he send those to hell that don't know him? In 1 Peter 1 16 it says, be holy because I am holy. In Revelation, we see God declare, declared, holy, holy, holy. We sing it, we declare it, we proclaim it. Holiness is, uncor- is uncorruptibility. It's perfection. It's purity. It's the inability to sin. It's the inability to be in the presence of sin. And it's something that God is, perfectly holy. Holiness is the very nature of God's character. And his character is perfect, without flaw. And he is the standard of all that is right and good. And he sets that standard. In Romans 10 verse 9 it says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When we believe that Jesus is Lord, we are believing in the holy God. We're saying, holy God, we come under you. And what you say goes, regardless of how much it hurts, regardless of how much it is uncomfortable for us. We accept that Jesus is the truth. 
like he said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We had a guy come to the church a couple of weeks ago now, just wandered in, and he started talking to us about his religion and his faith. And it was an all-encompassing faith. And he talked about how always go to heaven, always get to God. And he stood there and he talked and I listened. And the other person that was with me listened and talked with him. And then we got to a place where actually he took a breath so I could speak. He was a little bit like me, but the opposite. So I got, the, I got this moment and I said, I totally understand what you're saying, my friend. But you see, the reason why you dislike people that try and convert others is because you haven't heard the truth. And the truth is that Jesus is the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. The guy got all and, and walked out. Because it's an absolute. What Jesus says is truth. What his word says is truth. And I can't redesign it, retranslate it, or ignore the bits I don't like if I, if I confess Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. There's a famous quote that Francis Assisi, that people like to, to talk about, preach the gospel and sometimes use words. I feel that's unhealthily focused on by some people. And social action has taken the forefront of the church's outreach. In fact, it's become the only outreach. We do food banks. We do debt advice. We do all these things which are good things and they should be something that the church does. But we need to remember and hold on to Romans 10 verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We are called to tell people and preach them the gospel. We're called to talk to them. We're called to share with them our testimonies. It is by the blood of the lamb and the testimony of his people that we will overcome the enemy. It is not about just food banks. It's not about feeding the person. It's about giving people the gospel and feeding them. But actually God's more interested in their souls, more interested in their eternity than he is in their bellies. He is interested in their bellies, don't hear me wrong. But that's why today has been preached. To give us a reminder of what we are saved from. We don't come to church, confess our sins and join this happy clappy bunch of people. And we're all of a sudden we're in this nice gang. And we're in this nice family. Uh, look around, do you really want to be in this family? No. That's not the purpose of the church. That's not the purpose of why we were saved. We were saved to go make disciples of the nations. What are we making them disciples for? To save them from eternal punishment. If you don't know Jesus this morning, if your friends and families don't know Jesus this morning, then tomorrow if they passed away, they would not be with you in heaven. And that should stir every one of us in here. To want to share the gospel. To want to share Jesus. I've heard so many people say, well, we don't have the right to talk into people's lives. Now, what makes us think that we can do this? Let me tell you, hell makes me think we can do this. I have to do it. 
I have to share the gospel. I have to tell people about Jesus. I have to tell my friends. I have to do it in a loving way. I'm not condemning anybody. But I want to share with them that they have a salvation. They have a rescuer. They have Jesus just like I do. And on that basis, I should not keep my mouth shut. And neither should you. John 3, 14, 18. Let's finish with this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Hell is real. Hell is horrendous. Hell is eternal. But it does not need to be yours, mine, or anyone's final destination. Because Jesus came to save us from that. So throw off everything that hinders you. Every sin that you commit that you have not repented of. Throw it off, repent of it, and move forward. Everything that stops you talking to your family members or your friends about Jesus, throw it off. Everything that takes up your time, that does not give you opportunity to share the gospel with, G with friends, throw it off. We're on a mission, people. And it's the mission of the Great Commission to go make disciples of the nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching people to obey everything that he has commanded us. We're having baptisms in October, which will be an immense time. Invite your friends and family to see a Christian go under the water and come up. Hopefully. <laughs> Who said please? There's a few of us in here that are praying for an opportunity to raise the dead. So let's not try and make it ourselves. Uh, I'm being serious though, guys. Hell is a real place. And that is what we are being saved from. God is stirring us in a time of getting out there and preaching the gospel, of sharing the gospel with others. It's a time for us to take it seriously and to go after everybody with an agenda. That agenda, to share Jesus. I've heard it said like this before, if I had the cure to cancer, what kind of a person would I be if I didn't share it with others? Each one of us in here who knows Jesus has the cure to cancer and much more. Don't allow the world, the enemy, to oppress you so much that you don't share the hope and the glory that you have in you. Because this is a life and death battle for your friends, family, neighbours, supermarket chums. I know that's a harsh word. Hell is not a nice subject for me to preach on. And some would say, you're a Christian, you shouldn't preach it. But no, I should. You see, what kind of a preacher, what kind of a pastor, what kind of a senior leader am I if I don't preach the whole gospel? If I don't preach the whole of the Bible? If I don't at least step and take us into journeys, into every part of it, the good, the bad and the ugly? I do not want anyone in here to ever be able to say, Dan, you never told us that bit. I do not preach a gospel where it says, come to Jesus and everything is rosy. Jesus says, in this world you will have troubles, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. 
I'm going to shut up. I have a book that I've bought with me. It is a really old book. It's called The Shock of Your Life. Some of you may recognise it, some of you won't. It was written by a guy called Adrian Holloway many, many years ago. And I've bought it because I think somebody needs to read it. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're at. But if you think you need to read this book, then come and get it off me. I would like it back. (laughs) It's a good book. And it is a book about three people. It's a book about a non-Christian. About a lukewarm Christian. And about a red-hot Christian. And they all have one thing in common. They died. And the book is about what happens after death for each of those three people. It is a really good book. It's not as morbid as it sounds. It's really encouraging, challenging, transforming. If that's you, that book's here. Come and get it from me. Let's just pray.